If time ever permits, I'd recommend taking time to read about the life and work of Nikola Tesla, fascinating individual who experimented in such complex things as x-rays, wireless communication, and of course, electricity. Just as complex and fascinating as the physics behind Tesla's work in electrical conduction is the biological system designed to carry out this very task. From micro to gross anatomy, the nervous system is awe-inspiring and something we will begin to explore today with our look at the spinal cord. Welcome back. Hopefully the discussion of the spinal cord acting as a highway system has had a chance to sink in. We're going to spend the second session looking at the, both the macroscopic and microscopic structures of the spinal cord, starting with a look at the cells that make up the spinal cord itself, and continuing with the gross anatomical discussion of the spinal cord. Objectives for this session. We're going to be looking at the general structure of the spinal cord from both a gross macroscopic and cross-sectional perspective. We'll also take a closer look at the microanatomy of the different types of neuronal cells and combine our knowledge of the macroscopic and microscopic anatomy to explore the stretch reflex. We'll introduce you to a style of nomenclature similar to what we use for the naming the vertebrae to identify the regions of the spinal cord and the spinal nerves. And finally, we'll throw in some clinical uh, perspectives for a good measure. The nervous system can be divided up in a number of different ways. For instance, we have the central nervous system, made up of the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, made up of spinal and cranial nerves. From this perspective, the spinal cord can be thought of as a superhighway, allowing communication between the brain and peripheral nervous system. We can also think of the nervous system as having a sensory or afferent component that sends information to the central nervous system from the periphery, and an efferent or motor component that sends motor commands to the peripheral effector organs. Still another division is between the somatic nervous systems involving general sensation and voluntary motor commands to the body walls and appendages, and the autonomic nervous system involving visceral sensation from and involuntary motor commands to the internal organs. The autonomic motor system can be further divided into sympathetic or fight or flight motor system and the parasympathetic or rest and digest motor system. Next, we're going to take a look at a typical neuron cell. We don't want to spend too much time on this as the focus of the class is gross anatomy, but in order to understand the macroscopic organization of the spinal cord and peripheral nerves, an overview of the nerve cell is necessary. As we'll see in the next slide, there are a few different classifications of neurons with very different morphologies. That being said, there are three characteristics that all of these cells share. First is a cell body containing the nucleus, which is responsible for the regulation of the function of the cell. Next is the input zone, where numerous projections of the cell membrane, called dendrites, receive incoming signals, either from sensory stimulation, in the case of sensory neurons, or from other neurons, in the case of interneurons or motor neurons. Third is the nerve axon, which conducts signals in the form of action potentials to target effectors, such as muscle cells or other neurons, through the axon terminus. Here we see three different classes of neurons and how they differ in their structure. The previous slide showed us what is called a multipolar neuron. In this group, multiple dendrites project directly from the cell body and there is a single long axon. Motor neurons fit into this classification. Bipolar neurons have a single long dendritic extension that projects from the cell body at one pole and an axonal projection at the opposite pole. These neurons are only found in limited parts of the body associated with the special senses and not really relevant to the present lesson. Pseudo-unipolar neurons bear a striking resemblance to bipolar neurons, except that the cell body is only indirectly connected to an exceptionally long channel connecting the input zone with the axon terminus. This is the classification typically seen with sensory neurons. In addition to neurons, a large collection of support cells called neuroglia provide support to the neurons and are actually far more numerous. These cells serve a number of important functions, including protection and immune defense. The neuroglia, pictured in the right-hand image, called Schwann cells, are specific to the peripheral nervous system. 
individual cells wrap around axons to provide insulation, similar to rubber insulation on an electrical wire. The overall effect, called a myelin sheath, resembles something like a sheath of jelly rolls connected end to end with a small node in between each. The central nervous system also has axonal myelination, but in this instance, a collection of cells known as oligodendrocytes extend numerous projections to insulate at multiple locations, sometimes across multiple axons. Myelination plays a vital role to normal neural conduction. Multiple sclerosis, a debilitating disease affecting millions of Americans, results from progressive loss of oligodendrocytes, a process known as demyelination. A similar disease is found in the peripheral nervous system. In this case, known as Guillain-Barre syndrome, the prognosis and potential for recovery is much greater. Time to look at the spinal cord itself. The cord can be described as an ellipsoid cylinder about the width of a pinky finger. This is a bit of an overgeneralization, however. In actuality, the spinal cord tapers as it moves inferiorly. This is the result of a difference in traffic load. In the neck, the spinal cord contains neurons supplying almost the entire body, upper limbs, torso, and lower limbs. In the lower back, the volume is far less. Neural traffic to the upper limb and torso doesn't travel inferiorly. Thus, the cord only contains neurons supplying the lower limbs. Using the highway analogy, freeways in major cities such as Los Angeles and Toronto have multiple lanes across to handle the volume. Here's an image of the 401 that I used to take to get into Toronto. And yes, that is an 18-lane stretch of highway you are looking at. Other highways in less traveled areas, not so much. Now, despite this tapering, there are two regions where we actually observe cord enlargements. The cervical enlargement occurs in the lower cervical region of the cord and is the result of a large proportion of neural tracts moving in and out of the upper limb in a small region. Similarly, the lumbar enlargement is the result of numerous neural tracts moving in and out of the lower limbs. Again, the highway analogy helps to explain this concept, as highways tend to widen as you approach major on and off ramps. One final point to make is that contrary to what people typically believe, the spinal cord does not run the entire length of the spinal canal. In reality, the spinal cord terminates at the level of L1 or L2 in an adult. To understand the reason that this occurs, we need to take a brief look at embryology. In a developing embryo, the spinal cord and vertebral column develop side by side. As embryological development continues, however, the vertebral column grows at a faster rate than the spinal cord, which appears to recede in the vertebral column. It's sort of like watching a 100-meter sprint on television, how the runners in the outside lanes fall back from those in the center lanes, even though everyone is still moving towards the finish line. As a result, the spinal cord terminates at the level of L4 in the neonate and continues to recede to the level of L2 or L1 in the adult, depending on the terminal height of the individual. The portion of the vertebral canal inferior to the termination of the spinal cord is filled with fluid and referred to as the lumbar cistern, a Latin term for water tank. As a consequence of this growth imbalance, spinal nerves exiting through the intervertebral foramen are stretched inferiorly and exit the vertebral canal at a lower level than their cord attachment. This becomes most evident in the lumbar region inferior to the termination of the spinal cord, where a large collection of spinal nerves are bundled together in the vertebral canal like a ponytail. This collection of nerves is given the name cauda equina because of its resemblance to the tail of a horse. Also note that the spinal cord is covered in the thin, delicate connective tissue we will be discussing later in this lesson, which anchors the cord to the coccyx. As the cord recedes within the vertebral canal, this connective tissue is stretched off the terminal portion of the cord and continues to extend to the base of the coccyx. This piece of connective tissue dangling from the tip is called the phylum terminal. Here's a depiction of the spinal cord in situ. Notice, as we have mentioned, the location of the cervical and lumbar enlargements and the terminal tip of the cord, known as the conus medullaris, at the level of L1. The cauda equina and phylum terminal are found in the lumbar cistern inferior to the conus medullaris. When viewed in cross-section, the spinal cord is seen to have two visibly distinct regions, resulting from differences in levels of myelination. 
the white matter is located around the cord's periphery and is composed primarily of tracks of myelinated axons. These tracks are highly organized, as was mentioned in the conceptualization exercise. All the axons within a given track are typically associated with a specific region of the brain, an organization pattern known as brain topography. At its most general level, we see a near-complete segregation between sensory tracks, distinguished in blue, which lie posterior laterally and send input to the brain, and motor tracks, distinguished in red, which lie anteromedially and send output signals from the brain to effector organs in the periphery. Gray matter is centrally located and is made up of a collection of cell bodies and unmyelinated interneurons, which allow for communication between different regions within the cord. It has a butterfly-shaped appearance and distinct functional zones. To the front of the spinal cord are the ventral horns, which contain the cell bodies for motor neurons, whose axons project from the ventral roots to reach their effector organs. The dorsal horns lie posteriorly and contain unmyelinated interneurons, which receive information from sensory axons entering the cord through the dorsal roots. Lateral horns are only found in the thoracic and upper lumbar regions of the cord. These contain cell bodies for the sympathetic portion of the autonomic nervous system, and will be discussed in more detail at a later date. Just as with the human body itself, the spinal cord has a sense of laterality, which each side of the cord responsible for a different side of the body. This is reflected on a gross anatomical scale with a near-complete division between left and right sides of the spinal cord, anteriorly by the prominent ventral median fissure, and posteriorly by the more subtle dorsal median sulcus. Left and right sides remain continuous in the centralized region of the cord, allowing for crossing of the specific spinal tracts. If the spinal cord can be compared to a major highway, spinal nerves can be compared to the perpendicular roads representing the exits from the highway. This is the root of the peripheral nervous system. Proximally, the spinal nerves bifurcate into ventral and dorsal roots that anchor to the anterior and posterior surfaces of the spinal cord, respectively. They can be thought of as on and off ramps for neural traffic, either entering or exiting the central nervous system. Ventral roots contain motor output to effector organs exclusively, whereas dorsal roots contain sensory input. The same sort of arrangement is seen with the separation of on and off ramps in a highway system. Note that, closer to the spinal cord, each root is composed by a series of rootlets that combine together before they exit the intervertebral foramen. A distinct feature of the dorsal root is a prominent bulge that can be identified in anatomical dissection called the dorsal root ganglion. If you recall from earlier in the lesson, we identified sensory neurons as pseudo-unipolar, where the cell body is located partway along the cytoplasmic extension between the dendrites and axons. The dorsal root ganglion reflects this aggregation of these cell bodies in a single location. The ventral and dorsal roots fuse around the level of the intervertebral foramen to form the spinal nerve proper, containing a mixture of both sensory and motor information. Past the intervertebral foramen, the spinal nerve almost immediately divides into ventral and dorsal rami. Rami is a Latin term meaning branch. You can probably see the analogy that the early anatomists made between the spinal nerves and trees, with the roots deep in the vertebral canal and the branches projecting away from the main trunk of the spinal nerve. The highway analogy can be used here as well, as branches represent side streets that can lead to different destinations within a city. The first division typically yields the relatively small dorsal rami, which we discussed in the previous lesson which supplies the intrinsic back muscles and the patch of skin along the dorsum of the body, and the more prominent ventral branches, which pretty much supplies everything else. Note that, unlike the ventral and dorsal root, the branches are a mixture of sensory and motor tracks, projecting to the respective regions of innervation, similar to the two-way traffic seen on city streets. Time for a break, and I strongly recommend that you take one rather than jumping headlong into the next session. We'll be looking at some rather difficult concepts related to radiating nerve pain, which will probably have a great deal of impact in your future careers. We'll see you after the break.